Hi, this is Pat McDonald, your host for Vote for Vermont. Um, and where our tagline, I almost forgot the tagline, is listening beyond the sound bites. Representative Tooth, you'll have to ask me what that means. It means if somebody says it's free, start asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> so joining me on this show, we have two guests, and we have Ben Kinsley joining us remotely, but Ben is co-hosting the show with me. And we have Rachel Feldman, um, who will be talking about her latest trip to Jerusalem, and we're very excited to hear about that. And, rep and with her is Representative Casey Toof, uh, who is, represents Franklin 8, mm -hmm. member of House Committee on Education. Mm -hmm. There's somebody we should talk to then about. We should uh, have no. you on just on education. We could fill there's, up a lot of time There's a that. few. Yes, we could. <laughs> but I do love your chair. Oh, sorry, we're talking House. I love her too, but I love the Senate chair. Mr. Senator Champion? Yep. Campion. Campion. Anyway. Yep. Anyway, welcome. No offense to the house, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're talking about my, one of my favorite sayings these days, bearing witness um, to what's happening in Israel and here in Vermont, sadly, but we should talk about that. So, Rachel, can I just start with you telling us a little bit about your background and remembering that you were on the board of directors of Orca Media for a while. I, I forgot about that. <laughs> I haven't. It was amazing. It was the first board that I was asked to join, and I was so honored, and I uh, served on this board for close to a decade. That's um, great. Well, you missed the move to the new the new digs here. Oh, I was part of this move. Oh, were you? really oh, supported excellent. it and was excited to get to the Vermont College of Fine Arts. It's a great location in yeah. Montpelier, and if you haven't walked your dog on the campus green, definitely do it. <laughs> <laughs> but my background in Vermont is I moved here in 2006 right after I graduated from Northwestern University in Chicago um, with a degree in journalism and I started working for the Times Argus in Barrie and Montpelier and for WCAX TV and I worked there until about 2011 when I moved to Israel for a year to teach English um, through a program with the Ministry of Education and I taught kindergarten through eighth grade. Um, I moved back here to Vermont. I spent a lot of time in public service. I served as chief of staff to now Governor Scott while he was lieutenant governor. Right. I worked in the Department of Corrections in the Agency of Human Services. And on October 7th, my student Ronnie Palvanov was murdered at the Nova Music Party in Ramle Lod, or at Reim, but he was my student in Ramle Lod. Oh. And that for me changed the trajectory of what I'm doing for work now. And that's what we're here to talk about. And we're about. so glad you are doing this. And God bless you for that, for real. Um, anyway, Casey, tell a little bit about yourself and uh, what you're up to. And also how you got so involved with um, Rachel and what she's doing here in Vermont and in Israel. Yeah. Um, I represent Franklin 8, which is St. Albans Town and a part of St. Albans City. And uh, I'm a ranking member on House Education. I've been, this is my third term in the House. Um, I live in the town uh, with my with my wife, and I have two kids. And um, you know, I really got involved with this. I've known Rachel since two thousand eight. I think. I want to say two thousand eight, and uh, through mutual friends, we've been involved um, with uh, politics, local politics in Franklin County, St. Albans, um, as well as statewide candidates and stuff. So I've known her for a while, and. Uh, I'm a, I like to think of myself as always being a student of history because I'm very interested in uh, history. I've got, I got a degree from Castleton in history, secondary ah, education. Love Castleton. And so... It was David Walk there when you were there? Yes, he was president oh, there. I was there from him. 04 to 08. <clears throat> oh, great. And uh, he was the president there. And I was, I was involved. I was the chief justice of the college court while I was there. Well, there you and, go. Uh, uh, but, um, no, I, I, I'm... I've known Rachel, we've become really good friends, and she's helped me out understand a lot of the conflict that's going on, and some of my, you know, just, un that helps with my understanding, and we'll get into, I know we'll talk about a few things that, right. uh, that, that to. Yeah, the, and, and the one thing I would like to ask you now, and then we'll, we'll turn over to Ben, is you were with Rachel when she got the phone call about her student being killed at the, uh, well, it was a music fair, wasn't it? Yeah, at the and, Nova Music Party yeah. in Rain. And I bet that must have, don't know how I would handle something like that. It must have had, a, had an endearing 
uh, impact on you. It did. It was one of those like caught you off guard. We, you know, weren't expecting that kind of phone call. I know that she she was aware of the situation and was waiting to hear back from her students and the people she knew over there. And when when I saw her reaction to that and the body language just fall, just falling over, it was really hard to to see that. Yeah. Seeing someone that you know. Um, hurting like that, but you can't understand the pain they're going through, so you have to kind of just, you know, be there for them. But it was it was really uh, something that was. I really can't changed. imagine because yeah. when you that's bringing it home here. Yeah, it really. Is. Um, that's really awful. Yeah. Anyway, Ben, do you want to jump in here and I'll stop talking for a moment? Uh, yeah, if sure. I can. <laughs> um, Rachel, I think you know you were on uh, WDEV with Kevin Ellis. Um, I think it was last week, um, and talking about um, your experience uh, with this. And you describe your, um, you know, you're Jewish, but you don't, you're not Jewish in a religious sense. I think is is what you told Kevin in that interview. Can you explain that a little bit for us and what that means for you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I was on the radio with Kevin right after I came back from Israel, my first trip back, which was in early January. I went to, as you said, Pat, bear witness to go to Re'im, where Roni was murdered, to go to Kfar Aza and Ofakim villages and kibbutzim that were absolutely devastated, destroyed by Hamas, right, where you could right. still smell the blood and the smoke. Um, and... For me, my affiliation with being Jewish is not necessarily related to anything having to do with a synagogue um, because Jews are an ethno-religious group. So by that, it means that we share a common ethnicity, a common place of origin, which is Israel. But we also, because of that, share traditions and culture and a religion. Right. And so there are religious traditions like lighting candles for Hanukkah and celebrating Passover and eating a lot of matzah, <laughs> which I'm doing right now because right. it's Passover and I'm sick of it already, but yep. that we do because it's just part of who we are. But my entire life, no matter what, I have been really proud to be Jewish because like these necklaces I'm wearing right now, they're from my family. They're things that we've worn in our family with the exception of these hostage tags for the 133 hostages that are still in Gaza. Um, with the exception of that, these are things that are passed down through the generations, and they mean something to us the same way that anyone who has a family heritage can relate to. These are things that we do. It comes from my grandmother who learned it from her grandmother. and. That's how I'm Jewish, and so I feel it in my bones. And when October 7th happened, um, I've been studying the Holocaust since I was eight years old. I've been studying other genocides since I was 12 years old. My grandfather liberated Dachau as a young Jew oh. who graduated from Harvard. And I felt in my bones, this is the moment when you've been Jewish your whole life, and so now you do Jew. There you go. There's a there's a bumper sticker. <laughs> I'll, I'll figure out how to finesse <laughs> yeah, but... <laughs> it, but maybe <laughs> raising money for the hostage um, and missing families forum. I've been to Dachau and the oh. camp there, and um, walked into the gas chambers, and it's probably the most eerie feeling that I've ever experienced because of the intent of that place, right? Um, what it was built to do, the purpose it was for. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, we're seeing something today where a lot of people have, have either lost that knowledge. And I know that's what we're, one of the things we're going to be talking about. Um, and that's not a lived experience for them where they can right. see, uh, where they, they have someone they know that lived through that. Um, like I have one of my, my best friend's grandmother lived through the Holocaust. She was in. Uh, Poland, and you know the, the we're losing those connections, those personal connections to that event, and I think um, that's partially, and not to get ahead of the conversation, but I think that's partially what we're trying to, uh, what you guys are trying to do uh, in correcting that. Yeah, and I, the people that what they call them Holocaust deniers just make me crazy because. Like your experience, my first husband's family was Jewish, 
And we lived with his mother uh, for a couple of months when we were first married. And she lost her entire family in the Holocaust. Um, they got on a train never to be seen or heard from again. And nobody makes that up. That's not something you make up or could even imagine that possible, right? I mean, that's it happened. And for those to deny it are mm -hmm. just makes me crazy. You know? so Either to case, deny the actual event or to deny the significance of it. Ex well, both to things. both, thank you. And as you also said, Ben, the intent, the intent of the place, the intent of the entire final solution, as Hitler and the Nazi party called it, um, the intent is truly what matters when we talk about right. genocide. And I think that's what we're, what you're, everybody here is most concerned about is the intent of what's happening, what's behind what's happening. Like we talked today about um, from the river to the sea, which I don't know if you've heard this, Ben, but it's, its meaning is just devastating. But I don't think the young people that are here in the United States chanting from have any idea what it means. And I'm, I know I'm getting ahead of myself, but let, let's talk about it because it sounds like the right time to, mm -hmm. to discuss. And Casey, jump in whenever you want, please, because I know you're very involved with all yeah. of this, please. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I know you're a legislator. You can do this. Oh, I, <laughs> we know how, yeah, we know how to butt <laughs> in when we need to. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so the saying that you mentioned, as it said, as translated into English, it sounds, first of all, very relevant to Vermont because it affiliates with nature from this body of water to this body of water and freedom. I mean, freedom is a tenant of who we are right. as Americans. But the first saying, the original saying in Arabic is from the water to the water, Palestine is Arab. And what that means is not a coexistence with the Jewish people. It is solely Arab. And that was the intent as shown on October 7th, to completely annihilate Israel, the Jewish people, and then the West. And the first two are stated in Hamas's charger, charter to eliminate Israel and the Jewish people, the world entire. And the Houthis go one step further with death to America. Right, right. And so with these phrases, what many Jews in the West hear is a call for genocide, a call for our genocide. Because when it's coupled with things like globalize the Intifada, the Intifada is when suicide bombers were on buses in Tel Aviv, in Jerusalem, in pizza shops, in places of everyday life, carrying out things like 9-11 on a daily basis, randomly, creating actual terror and then coupled also with phrases like, we don't want no two state, we want all of it. Right. And it is saying that this very, very tiny piece of land, where if you look at a map, it is like, this would be the Arab world and maybe a fraction of my pinky nail is Israel. Right. Just this place where Jews are able to live in freedom along with Arabs, Muslims, Christians, people who are agnostic, people of all faiths, I, it says that we want the Jewish people to not exist. So I think that Americans do not know that original meaning of the phrase and what they are actually promoting. Because I do not believe that the majority of Americans right. have bad intentions or wish bad things for other people. But... I don't believe that Americans are questioning enough exactly what they're they never, cheering for they and who they're do. standing with. Yeah, they don't question, they just accept. And that upsets me to no end. And it does help um, to, to listen to Rachel and have these conversations with her because I believe um, you went to the rally here in Montpelier and they were making those cheers, they were, they were saying those cheers and they were also saying them in English and in, um, in Arabic. In Arabic yeah. And you were just... I remember you telling me just how like flabbergasted that they don't understand what, what right. they're saying and what it means to people when they say it, directed it that way. Yeah. Well, um, we're going to talk about Hamas for sure, but I understand that you and Rachel both sat and saw part of the videos that were made by Hamas on October, um, oops, October 9th. 
seventh, October seventh. Seventh. Why did I say ninth? Yeah. Oh, I know why. October seventh, and that month, I don't can't imagine sitting watching that. It's it's really hard. It's one of those that you have to see, but you really don't want to see. Uh, I I don't want to equate it to PTSD, but it's like I see the images every mm -hmm. now and then. And uh, there was one that Rachel actually showed me, and uh, it wasn't like here sh see this. You have to see this. It was part of a montage of video that we saw, and there was a, a kid on there. I have I have two kids. I have a I have a well, he just turned nine. I was at eight, a nine and a seven year old. <laughs> And there was a kid, he had a slam dunk shirt on. I remember the, the green color shirt the kid had on. Um, and I won't get into the details of the, of the video, but right. the kid reminded me of my son. And all I could think about oh, is wow. my kid has a very similar shirt, looks just like this kid. How am I in this situation? Um, how would I be in this situation? And it just plays over in my head all the time. Uh, it does make me go home and hug them a little extra mm -hmm. tighter. Uh, but these are the kinds of things I think people really need to see them to get an, an understanding of what happened on October 7th. October 7th right. was, uh, you know, comparable to 9-11 here for Americans to understand. But this was hand-to-hand -hand combat. This were people looking people in the eye, children, right. uh, women and children, and doing things. Um, whereas 9-11, it was, you, they hid behind a plane. Right. Uh, and um, the destruction that followed there, this was like intent with you have to you have to have something inside you to be able to do that right exactly yeah ben i think um you know i think it is this is a 9 11 or this was a 9 11 like moment for uh israel right it, you know the, we saw um within the last number of days that the uh, intelligence director for israel stepped down because they they missed this like this is this was in his opinion a, a massive intelligence failure, much the same way that you know nine eleven was a, a pretty massive intelligence failure for the U.S. Um, and I and I think the reaction, the global reaction, um, was quite different, right? Um, and I'm kind of curious what you guys think, uh, what the two of you think about why the reaction to October seventh was so different versus 9-11. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Rachel, you want to jump in on that? I I feel like I'm on the edge of a cliff, and am I going to jump or not? Well, <laughs> Oh, jump, it's okay. Yeah. I'm oh, going to jump. Just do it. It's because of the Jews. It's because of anti-Semitism. It is because Israel's soul among nations is held to an impossible standard of defending itself with zero civilian casualties, or of just being willing to take the win of not so many people died, or of being told on October 7th, as we were still searching for Ronnie, as we still did not know, we did not know until October 9th right. that he was dead. And the reason for that is because Hamas shot him four times in the face. Oh. And it was an immediate reaction to say resistance is justified when people are occupied. I was seeing this message on October 7th. If you look at certain Instagram accounts for Students for Justice in Palestine at certain universities that are seeing these encampments right, right now, they were reestablished on October 5th and they were ready to go and rally with messaging on October 9th. Right. And they had pre-printed signs from an unnamed funding source by October 12th. Um, this has all been part of what was in Hamas's charter as soon as they were elected by the people of Gaza in 2006 after Israel unilaterally withdrew in 2005, that we will destroy the state of Israel and kill every Jew. And you mentioning the signs, I've noticed here in the United States and in Vermont, that all the signs are, signs are magically the same. Mm -hmm. Nothing's hand-drawn, nothing's written with crayon or whatever. They're all printed from someplace and all the same. And the same with the tents, the, the tent cities that have been set up in the colleges, they're all the same. And what, and I, I think Ben brings up a point about the, the minister stepping down. It must have taken them years to build these tunnels under the under the hospitals 
and, and in strategic places where they know people aren't going to bomb because sick people are there, or nursing homes or something. I mean, they must have been at this a while. I truly urge everybody to look up UN Watch. This is an organization run by a man named Hillel Neuer. And they have been watching UNRWA, which is the UN arm tasked with the Palestinian refugees. And it has been proven that billions of dollars in international aid have been diverted for the purposes of building a terror state, or as I've been calling it, the world's most elaborate soundstage to make up an appearance of a genocide. Because it is not a genocide what is happening in Gaza, but when you build terror infrastructure underneath schools, hospitals, mosques, right. and civilian homes where people that I know in the IDF say when we go into civilian homes, the first place we go is the children's bedrooms because that's where the tunnel shafts are and that's where the weaponry is hidden. Uh. When you hide behind your most vulnerable and behind your civilian infrastructure and behind places like hospitals that are supposed to be under the protection of international humanitarian right. rights law. You are setting your civilian population up to be killed, to be the byproduct. And there is a reason for that. Could you share with us the statistics you gave me on the phone this afternoon about the number of hospitals in Gaza versus Israel and why that is? Well, in terms of why this is, this is still something that needs to be researched. But in Israel, there's a population of 9 million people. And I spoke to the director of Israel's largest hospital. For the entire nation of Israel, 9 million people, there are 25 general hospitals. In Gaza, where there is a population of 2.2 million people, there are 36 general hospitals. If there are hospitals, right? Well, we know for a fact the IDF has verified evidence of this, and there has also been a recent, very successful reoccupation by the IDF of Al Shifa Hospital, but that they have used these hospitals as fronts and headquarters for terror infrastructure. There is also closed camera TV footage of Hamas bringing um, Israeli hostages into the hospitals on October 7th. This is on closed camera TV footage. Hmm. So do you uh, yeah. sort of alluded to this, but do you think um, October 7th was, for lack of a better term, a trap for Israel to fall into? Oh, that's interesting. Oh. I, I'm not sure that I'm the one to speak to that. Um, all I can say in response is, if this happened on American soil, if a terrorist group had come onto American soil and in cold blood, eye to eye, face to face, killed what per capita would be the equivalent of 40,000 Americans and taken thousands more hostage, what wouldn't we do right. to get our families back? Right. What wouldn't right. we do? And so no matter what, whether this was a trap, whether this was meant to incite something larger, I have to look to the most core essential parts of our humanity and ask, what wouldn't we do to get our family back? Just right. yesterday, Hamas released video of Hirsch Goldberg Poland, who's 23 years old. The last time we saw proof of life of him was on October 7th, a video taken by Hamas of him with his left arm blown off, oh, being thrown right. into the back of a pickup right. truck. And mm. yesterday, Hamas released a video of him still alive, without his arm. Wow. Um, obviously taken under duress, but what would, he's an American. He was born in Berkeley, California. Right. And, and what are we Where doing? Where are we yeah. for him? Right. Yeah, that's, that's just really horrendous. I know you have on your Facebook one of the most compelling pictures as you were talking about, uh, about the video. It's a picture, you have your hand or somebody's got their hand uh, on a on a um, fence, a wire fence or something, is that you? Oh, that to me. Yeah. And and you're looking across. I'm assuming at, at Gaza, and you're yep. saying, 
we're coming for you. And I, it will get me crying now. It upsets me to no end to um, when I thumb go through your Facebook. That is an amazing picture. Mm -hmm. That is just amazing. And um, I'm sure they're working, I would hope. I don't want to think otherwise, that they're working really hard to free these hostages. But it's been a long time. And then to have proof of life, that's, that's amazing. But there's how many do, we, do you know? There are currently 133 hostages in Gaza, but something that's important to understand is that when a person is dead and their body has not been returned, they are still considered a hostage by the state of Israel. Um, under Jewish tradition, right. a person, every remain of them must be buried right. for them to find peace. Within 24 hours, correct? Or some time? <sighs> I mean, some of it's not possible under circumstances well, under like these this, circumstances, but, but to have the person back. Right. And so right now, um, we know that two of those hostages are not alive. They're rumored to be more who are not alive, but mm. they are all still our hostages. And I, I w when I was in Israel in 2011, Gilad Shalit was still held hostage. And when I landed, I didn't know who Gilad Shalit was. He was taken hostage three or four years prior by Hamas, oh. close to the Gaza envelope. And I mean, his face was everywhere. I honestly, I landed, I thought there was this celebrity, <laughs> like this attractive <laughs> young guy, his yeah. picture's all over the place. No, he's held hostage. Huh. And he was returned while I was there. And the entire country stopped. Everybody stopped, got to a TV, oh, I, stood out right. in the roads, watched the helicopter right. bring him home. In Israel, the pictures of the hostages are everywhere. Their names are everywhere. Their names are known. We set an empty Seder plate and an empty chair for our hostages this year at Passover. Um, Israel does not forget its family. The Jews don't forget our family. That's great. That's great. Anyway, um, I know, Casey, you were very vocal, I understand. Our dear legislators um, wrote a, I don't know who prompted it, but they wrote a letter mm -hmm. to President Biden asking them to, uh, asking him to do, uh, to implement a ceasefire, like he can't, he doesn't have the power to do that, but to try to get a, negotiate a ceasefire. Um, and there were 50, trying to see the number here, have it written, I think, 50-some legislators that signed that, which actually surprised me when I mm -hmm. saw the, the list. What, what were you trying to get the message across to them? Well, I, I received a text message in the morning at like 6.30, like, hey, have you seen this email? So I went and checked my email as I was getting ready for work, and I was just like, oh. I, I, I got angry at first when I saw it because it was, it was calling for a, a ceasefire. Um, it, was, it admitted a lot of facts. Um, first of all, it didn't, it didn't say anything about Hamas. It didn't mention anything about the hostages, including the five Americans. Right. Um, it didn't mention anything that Israel does have a right to defend itself. It didn't talk about the 1,200 people that were murdered. It didn't talk about um, basically any of the things that are happening. And it also didn't acknowledge that Hamas has denied every ceasefire right. uh, negotiation that's been sent out there. Right. And so I sent an email saying basically what I just said. And, um, and, and I mean, the, the silver lining is they did add some of the, the points that I did make um, in the final letter. But I, I think President Biden, uh, I don't think they care what the Vermont legislature has to say. I, I, don't, I know Hamas does not care what the Vermont legislature has to say. And, and so we're, we're just we're trying to get a resolution or some kind of statement out there that is um, all it does is it makes people... Uh, you know, specifically in, in my in my constituents that are members of the Jewish community feel quite uncomfortable that sure. they, that the state of Vermont is going to focus on this. I, and I thought it was kind of inappropriate, and uh, and so I had to speak out. Uh, I was the only, I think I was the only one that actually made a statement on it. Good um, for you. So I, I just wanted to make sure that they knew that I was not happy. Okay. Uh, May I ask where our congressional delegation is on this issue? Dare I, I ask? don't know. Or you would they probably haven't know said anything. I. Have they said a thing? Um, this isn't good that you're not responding quickly. Yeah. <laughs> Makes I, me think I don't they've remained quiet. I, yeah. Seriously? 
I have respect for our congressional delegation. I do not have respect for the way our congressional delegation has handled this issue and the way our congressional delegation has communicated or rather not communicated with the Vermont Jewish community. Right. Um, I, I think that a fringe minority group, Jewish Voice for Peace, which represents less than 10% of the Jewish population worldwide, is driving a narrative that is not representative of what most of us who are Jewish in Vermont are feeling. And I know that our congressional officials, we elect them to do a job and we trust them with that. But I really don't think that they understand fully the impact that their actions are having here at home in right. Vermont. Um, especially as Senator Sanders and Congresswoman Ballant are Jewish. It, <laughs> Sorry, it I gives laugh. tacit permission to people to be anti-Semitic, which many of the people who are supporting you know, the pro-Palestine side, which when I say that, it sounds like I'm anti-Palestinian, which is not true. But many of the people who support that right. side right are not educationally, informationally equipped to differentiate their criticism of the Israeli government and their military response from anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. And as a result, Vermont Jews, I think, are really bearing the brunt of this in a way that I am not sure is reversible. It's, it's really- That's a great point that like, there should be room to criticize the Israeli government and the military without alienating the global Jewish population. And that is a nuance that is lost on too many people, I think. Um, and that's, I think, one of the most productive things that we as a community of Vermonters can talk about is how do we navigate that of like, what are, what are things that are inbounds and what are things that are out of bounds uh, in that conversation? Yeah, I, that's a good point. And I, I, I obviously know Senator Sanders is Jewish. I did not know that uh, Rebecca Ballant was Jewish. So that's two people that certainly should have spoken up to the community here because when they're running for election, I bet they reach out. There you go. Um, so how is the mood in the legislature um, <laughs> about all of this? I mean, is there a conversation? I mean, if there was a ceasefire as they're asking for, what does that mean? They're not, it's not going to be kept forever because these people have, have sworn to, to the death. Um, yeah. that's, not, that's not changing in a yeah. ceasefire. So the the mood in the legislature, uh, it's one of those. I feel like it's we don't talk about it a lot. Uh, it's not something that right. comes up in conversation, um, at least not with me around me, because I feel like I've made my well, you probably my yeah, voice right. uh, on that uh, well known. Um, and and like I, I mean, I, I alluded on it earlier that Hamas has been offered how many ceasefire resolutions that right. they've rejected mm -hmm. every single one. I don't think there is an intent for them to ever have a ceasefire. Um, it's the one that this week, I believe there was one this week where uh, the United States, along with 18 total countries, signed on saying, release the hostages, right. and it'll be a six-week ceasefire, and Hamas rejected that again. So I don't know what uh, a call for a ceasefire is. The call for the ceasefire has to be a call to Hamas, not, um, not the IDF or Israel. Right. And I would think if they're going to put their energy into that, they should put their energy into bringing home the hostages, mm -hmm. especially with five of them being Americans. Yeah. I mean, what are they doing? I don't understand. I really don't. I don't, I don't know. Some, somebody's gaining something from this because back to the signs are all the same. Somebody is pulling the strings somewhere. And because nobody really understands. If you ask the guy on the street, what is this all about? I, I have been involved with Jewish people my entire life. I was married to a, a Jewish guy. And I don't, I don't understand. I'm really, I hate to be, sound stupid, but I don't understand what the hatred's all about. I really don't. Um, unless I'm, I, I know I live in a cone 
you know, an igloo of sorts, but mm -hmm. um, I don't get it. And so you look at the legislature and how many people up there, well-known members of, of our legislature are Jewish. Uh, what are we doing? I, to that point, I'll say it's a scary time to be Jewish. Um, and one of the reasons that I, I feel so secure in speaking out is because I don't have children. Uh, and so I, I don't truly feel that I'm putting others at risk when I speak out. But if I had children, I can't imagine how I would feel, but I know what I have heard from my friends, how terrified they are to make their children targets in schools because there's a lot of anti-Semitism happening in Vermont schools right now, not just in colleges. Really? But in, the, in the lower grades? Yes. Really? Yes, there is. And this gets to our point about Holocaust education. Um, a lot of what I'm hearing from Jewish parents is that when their kids come home and tell them that kids are drawing swastikas and saying Nazi, that their kids are saying, but they don't know what that means. Well, I was just going to say, they can't possibly know what, the, what that really means. Right. No? But I, I know the amount of Holocaust education I got. It started in fifth grade. I mean, obviously not with the things that we saw when we were in high school because you build up to that, right. but just the awareness of it, I, and also being Jewish, I am at an advantage of knowing, you know, you don't draw the swastika, but kids around me knew that as well, and that it was affiliated with something that, this is like the worst that you can be. And when I hear that kids in Vermont schools just don't know what it means, well, that says to me that there's something that we need to fix here, right. because... I, the Holocaust is a historic fact. It's not up for interpretation. It just, right. it is. Now, you two visited the Holocaust Museum and watched it together, correct, with your correct. wife? And yep. What, I would love to, to go see this, and shame on me. What, what did you feel when you were there and saw the pictures and understood uh, what it was trying to tell you? So it was my first trip to D.C., Oh. And I was with my wife. I was there for, uh, I actually won an award. It was a nice, it was a ce like a celebratory time. And um, Rachel uh, and her husband came down and um, she's like, well, I'm like, we got to go see some stuff. I'm kind yeah. of a nerd. So I was like, let's go see some stuff and like some history. And she's like, we have to go to the Holocaust Museum. So uh, I'm, a, I understand like history and my wife, not so much following the history uh, we went there and we spent what four hours there, maybe around that time, around that much. Yeah, I wasn't really looking at my watch. <laughs> yeah, but it was we you get you get sucked in and you get stuck looking at things. And um, since then, that was in like December twelfth or something like that. It was around that time. We we've, we've been trying to come up with a word on how we felt, and we can't figure out what word to describe because it was we were in awe, but it was like. How could people do this to one another? Um, and you're just learning so much more. Uh, and um, one of the things that got me, that really hit me, was they have all the names in there. And we went to one exhibit, and what the, you know, Feldman was there. Oh, and was I'm, it Rachel? And oh, I yeah. and I look at Rachel, and she's like, yeah, like yeah. it's. But for me, I'm not like my last name's not on there. It to uh, it's like how can you feel this, and we like we're trying to learn and empath empathize, but we don't understand what she's going through. So we're trying to understand, but then we're just like reflecting on it ourselves. Um, something that I think everyone needs to go see. Yeah. Um, the just it, they it's really well done. The, the museums did a great job. Um, we could have stayed there for hours. Long. I think we spent a long time in the gift shop after too because we were just looking at the books and all right. the. Uh, um, you were finding things about your like units that your grandfather was in and stuff like that. Yeah. So it's cool, like like history stuff like that, but it's also just so shocking and you it's an experience. It's not so much like you're seeing, oh, this is the another artifact. It's you're yeah. seeing actual history and what I was sitting here thinking about when when you hear the numbers, I don't think anybody understands what that means, but I bet seeing the list of names it yeah. makes it real. Yeah. Um, and ben, have you ever visited the museum in your travels? I have, and 
the thing that sh stood out to me the most um, was the shoes, the, uh, oh, no. the train cars full yeah. of shoes because they kept the shoes because they, at that point in time, shoes were quite valuable. Um, so, you know, that, that to me, probably more than anything else conveyed the scale of what we were talking about. Uh, wow. And, and yeah. Um, for me too, uh, so they put you on an elevator and they bring you to the top floor and you kind of like a, you do a timeline and it goes through. And for me, um, seeing how the 1930s shaped Germany and seeing parallels to things that are happening in real time today was something that really hit me too. Because you didn't get to the deaths until, you know, a floor or two down. It's that beginning stuff where there's the anti-Semitism and they're, they're going after Jewish businesses and they're going, right. they're replacing uh, Jewish professors uh, and, and right. all this leading up to what eventually became the Holocaust. That's to me like you need to spend more time on these to figure right. out why we got there because if you don't learn from history, you're bound to repeat it. Right. And, we're and you to had erase, a better line than that. We're too, trying to erase history, aren't we, in some yeah. cases? Let's just take down that statue, yeah. you know, and just forget it well, ever happened. And, and it started in Germany, it started on college campuses. Right, yeah, not right. parallel. That's scary here, and we have uh, students that are setting up uh, statues celebrating terrorists on college campuses, and that's that's terrifying. Um, that that that's happening, um, and I think that some of those patterns are concerning. Uh, that we we're seem to be heading back in a direction that we were headed in a hundred years ago. How do you make them see? where we are and how do you stop it? I, Because when people are that entrenched in that idea, it's sort of when you argue politics with people, yes. I think I'm right, you yeah. think you're right. Yeah. How, how do you make it, how do you change it? I mean, I, you're thinking education and, and the Holocaust and... Well, I, I think there's gonna, there is going to be a big gap where there has to be some, something Aside from just Holocaust education, we have to, though, repair this wrong of not teaching right. our children the Holocaust. But for this group in between, I, one of the most striking parallels, to your point, Ben, is in 1938, there is an image of Hitler Youth with their arms locked outside of the University of Vienna in Austria, barring Jewish students from entry. And just a few nights ago, the protesters at Yale oh. locked arms and barred a Jewish student from entering a building, blocked him. And you can see this image. It is, it is history just 80, right. 90 years later. Yep. And, and Why don't they see it? I mean, these people are because not Because they stupid. haven't studied it. Huh? Because they haven't studied and it. And they well, haven't learned that. And also they think that it's for a different cause and also... Something that needs to be talked about is that the Holocaust has maybe taught us one thing, that we're not allowed to say we don't like Jews. But we can say, but I don't like Zionists. The way that the word Zionist has right. been hurled at me with the tone of voice, with the inflection, also mm -hmm. with the way that it's coupled with Nazi, right. which I get every day online, Zionist has become a replacement for Jews. Jew, but a Zionist is, and this is the definition, somebody who believes that Israel has a right to exist and that Jews have a right to self-determination in the land of their origin. And not necessarily mm -hmm. Jewish? Is that what Zion means? The Jewish people. Oh, okay. It, it is oh, the Jewish people, but okay. Israel is a population of 9 million, 7 million right. Jews, 2 million Arabs, as well as Christians, Buddhists, agnostics. Right. There is a Baha'i temple in Haifa, it's gorgeous obviously, but it's that Jews have a right to self-determination and okay. that Israel has a right to exist. Well, and we've been political allies since we're 75 years. It's the only democracy in the Middle East. And why, why do we want to see it go away? I mean, of course, they want to see us go away, too. So maybe that... Israel this, doesn't this want to see America go away at all. For me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I'm not a big one world order person. Um, but anyway, Ben, when you were talking about the museum uh, and the shoes, you walked away feeling something. And what was that? 
Um, I think it. I, I think it was the same feeling that uh, Casey had. Uh, yeah. I think it was it. a loss for words. Yeah. Um, trying to understand how humans can do this to one another, um, and I think some of the things we're seeing today speak to that. Like I can see how, you know, people are. Uh, groups of people are incredibly hurtful to each other right. and um you know the divisions that we see in this country today and the hatred that follows it i can totally see how you know uh nazi germany got caught up in that right. and uh and i think that and it's as much as it's about you know october 7th and and uh anti-semitism and all those other things i think that just the um the hatred and animosity in our country right now in general is concerning to me. Um, and anti-Semitism is one component of that. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's, I don't know how we navigate through it. Uh, and perhaps uh, the two of you have some ideas. I know there's a bill in the legislature about Holocaust education. Perhaps we can talk a little bit about that and where it's at. I believe it's moved over from the Senate to the House and there's potentially a vote on oh. it in the next year too. But that's a, like one of the small things that we can do to try to start moving the needle back. And in the, what's in a the reaction direction. to that bill, Casey? Is that something that's people supported? Or? So the bill, the bill itself that um, is in House Education that passed over from the Senate, it's S one sixty seven. It's the miscellaneous Senate. It's the Senate miscellaneous Ed Bill. Ah. Um, so it's a, it's got a whole bunch of stuff. There's some construction language in there. There's um, I'm trying to think. We just had testimony on it today. I'm drawing a blank. But Section 4 is Holocaust education. Uh, but it's really, it's a really small part of it. What this is, is asking the Agency of Education to do a study oh. to figure out how much, uh, how many different schools actually have it in their curriculum. Right. And it, it, there, are, there are two bills, one in the House, one in the Senate, that are still on the wall that haven't been taken up that actually will mandate Holocaust education. So the bill that's, in, that's being considered... Um, that will probably come out next week, or it has to be the next two weeks. Um, that section four is in there that is going to just ask the agency of education to do a study. I'm sorry, but what's the diff? If you want it, just say make it happen. If your school already has it, good for you. Yeah. Why do you have to count? Um, it's a summer study, and we can say we did something. I, I don't. I don't know the reasoning behind the Senate putting it in there. Um, because I can't speak for them. Yeah. Uh, we've been really, and I, and I will, we, we do have an excuse. We've been dealing with the, yeah. the yield bill and the, oh, yeah, the property tax problem. I heard testimony problem. on the radio today about that. <laughs> we could talk, like I yeah. said, I could come back yeah, and we could exactly. talk about it for a few hours. But um, uh, so when we, you know, we, we, we talk about what's going to be brought up, and that came over in the Senate Ed Bill. Um, I wish I could go more. I wish we could pull that off the wall and take up this as a really big priority of mine. Right. But, you know, we do have two weeks left. Um, so, it will be nice to know how many schools teach it, how many schools mandate, like have, have that in their right. curriculum. Um, because, you know, I have kids that are going up through school. They're going to hopefully learn a lot of different right. pieces of history. And this is one that I think is really important for them. When they're old enough, I don't think I could get them to sit through a four-hour visit to the Holocaust Museum just yet. <laughs> Um, they're coming to the state house tomorrow, so they're not old enough to go there yet. Maybe to the children's exhibit on the first floor. Yeah, and that, and that was there is the there is a nice children's exhibit there um, that they could see. But um, they're actually coming to the state house tomorrow, so I'll gauge how long they can Excellent. sit still. There you go. Um, but it's it's going to be really it's it's really important to me, and I think this is a could be a first step. Um, and it, it's like I said, it's going to be something going forward that's going to be really on my plate. You know, we were talking about students, but you and I were talking today about a professor who in Colombia, Jewish professor, got his tag or whatever um, deleted so he couldn't have access to the university because they say they couldn't protect him. And he's pretty vocal. You knew his name and I didn't catch it. Yeah, his name is Shai Davidai. He is a professor, I believe, in the business school at Columbia right. University. And he is Israeli, and he is, has been very outspoken um, since October about what's been happening on the Columbia campus. And I believe it was yesterday or perhaps the day before, he stated his intention to go to campus and to walk through campus, and especially to go to the encampment. Um, as is his right as a professor of the university, and the university shut off his ID badge, right. saying that they couldn't <clears throat> guarantee his safety. Um, 
I, I would urge everyone to look at his Twitter, at his Instagram. He's very vocal. Um, he posts a lot and updates frequently. Could you repeat his name? Shai Davidai. And he is one of, I would say, the canaries in the coal mine. Um, people who, I, I'm not equating myself with him because what he is doing, he is a powerhouse, but those of us who we saw October 7th and we said, this is something that is out of the ordinary, this is something that is a pivotal moment, and for me, I knew that I had nothing else that I could possibly do with myself or my voice but speak for and on behalf of and in support of the Jewish people and the state of Israel and peace and coexistence. Um, and he has been compelled in a similar way, but he has been facing um, an administration at Columbia that I think is going to be pretty indicative of what we're going to see on college campuses throughout the nation. And he's made no bones about what's happening with, the, is, with Israel and with the Jews in the United States and America itself. Mm -hmm. He is um, not encouraged by the future of America and what's happening. I agree well, with him on that um, point. I'm sorry, Speaking of Columbia, um, there was a letter that 170 professors at Columbia University signed uh, that essentially justified the October 7th attack. Um, oh, wow. And I yes. think when you talk about that, um, you can write about sympathy for uh, the, the situation in Gaza um, and for the, the people of Gaza and the situation that they're in. Um, and that's and that's fine. I think when you start trying to justify a terrorist attack, um, you know, where you know you're you have a group of people that's murdering another group of people uh, uh, face to face, um, I think that's a totally different thing uh, and speaks to uh, um, a moral issue uh, in in a lot of ways. Um, just as a human, not you know. A, that that that's a that's a problem, and it's pretty rampant. Apparently, seems to be on our college campuses. College campuses. Yeah, I'm I'm assuming a lot of people I um, would hope because I'd be pulling my children out, and would stop funding, because this is this is abhorrent. It's just outrageous. Yeah, and I, and and donors are already starting to show displeasure. This type of. Um, you know, thinking that is on college campuses is definitely not reflected in the business community. You see the business community go in the other direction on a lot of these things. And guess who funds a lot of those endowments? It's the business community. Right. There's been a few on television already that yeah. said, I'm so and so, CEO of what or whatever. Well, and Robert that's... Kraft. I know. <laughs> the New England yeah. Patriots. Yeah. Yeah. Just exactly. pulled, he's a Columbia alum, yeah. and he pulled yeah. all of his donations. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can't be proud of that. No, I, I think, think there is. Sorry, Ben, go on. I, I was going to say, I, I think, um, you know, there, there's a, a role that all everyone can play in trying to um, denounce hatred and, you know, uh, and supporting people who are suffering, regardless of who that is. Um, I think one of the things that is pretty telling, and I want to make sure we get it in here um, before we run out of time, something that you said, Rachel, on your WDEV interview. Um, was that you felt safer in Israel right. than you feel here in Vermont, which is kind of surprising considering you have rockets being hurled at you in Israel. <laughs> and uh, last I checked, Vermont does not have that problem. Um, so can you explain that statement a little bit and what that means, what that statement means to you? Okay, yes, the Iron Dome. Yeah, in Israel, I have the Iron Dome, number one, which is incredible. It is... Israel has the magical hat that protects it from incoming rockets. It is an inc it's a miracle of defensive technology. But in addition, if I am in Israel and something bad happens to me and I need help and I scream help, I mean, you're literally going to be have to have to be pushing people away to be like, "No, no, no, we got this. It's fine. It's fine. We don't need more help." Here in America, and I've experienced this personally. If something happens to me, people are going to go, oh, stop complaining, it's not that bad. Or they'll gaslight and say it's not really occurring. 
or they'll come up with some excuse as to why it was justified, with the exception of very few people. Oh. I mean, and I feel so grateful that I have found my allies in October 7th for all of the people that I lost or from whom I heard nothing. People like you, like you, like you have come into my world, like stormed in and been like, what can I do to help? And that shows you who's really there. Yeah. In Israel, um, like these necklaces that I'm wearing, when I walk down the street or if I undo my jacket in a store, I will very frequently see people's faces change. Hmm. Because they look at this and they suddenly think that I am whatever they have been led to believe a Jew or an Israeli is. Right. I had somebody physically recoil mm -hmm. from me when I tried to shake their hand and I told them that I live in Israel. Here in the Vermont State wow. House, they physically recoiled from me and wouldn't shake my hand. Mm -hmm. um, is that right? I was there. I saw. I saw. The whole I don't thing. even want to know who. Maybe I do afterwards. It, it <laughs> wasn't an elected official. Oh, okay. It was not. Oh my god. Um, but. In Israel, I mean, first of all, if someone doesn't like you, they're going to tell you right to your face, very honestly, and why. Right. It's a very honest culture. There's no time to waste. They'll be like, oh, and by the way, you've gained weight, too. Not to be mean, <laughs> just because they're honest. Yeah. But you know that if you went up to them and you said, hey, I, I don't have somewhere to go for Shabbat, or hey, I don't know how to get to this place. They're going to stop and they're going to help you. And if they don't speak as much English as you need them to speak or you don't speak as much Hebrew as they need, they'll pull someone over, they'll find someone and to help you. this is regardless and, of yeah. who they are. They're just yeah. Israelis. It, it's right? just the is way it, of the culture. It's, that's great. We give, we care for. And one of the things that I have always been brought up with as a Jew is that we don't, want to harm other people. We want to live in peace. Israel has not started a single one of the eight wars that it's been involved in, but Israel has won every single one. All right. And um, I'll just say to that, Ben, uh, my wife and I are very close friends with Rachel, and we say, you know, listen, we're sorry. This is our ignorance. We don't, we don't understand why you feel so safe over there not here. And so we try to reach out, but we show our ignorance and as being uh, from here, and we, we try to say, we wish you were home, and but she's like, I feel home there, and, and we right. under, like we understand that better. It's it's actually better for us to understand where she's coming well, from. Well, it's she good tells you ask, that. and I think yeah. Rachel appreciates that. I I don't experience mamash, the mamash. things she's experienced. I don't yeah. you experience can't understand being that. gay. I don't. There's so many things that I yeah. I live in this little bubble, mm -hmm. and the only way you're gonna understand is to ask. Yeah, and uh, and that's the thing. I I see people they don't ask. Yeah. And, and I I'd say, assume. before I open my mouth, I say, I ask Rachel for advice on these kinds of things. <laughs> right. Because um, I'm not an expert on international. But then you ask questions back, which is awesome, yeah. too. <laughs> You're not and a parent. It shows, it shows that, that he's interested, and you just keep asking questions, too. Yes. Because there's a lot of stuff I don't understand about this. And I we, will say, and Haley, uh, Casey's wife, can definitely reinforce this more, but Casey debates a lot. Oh, so. well, there you go. We need that. Anyway. But it's good to ask questions, though, because we don't get the full yeah. answer. You're looking at the clock, yeah. and so am I. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Ben, thank you very much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you all. Yeah, this thank is you, great and thank you both and very much. Thank you for all that you're doing. And I know you will keep up the fight, and you let us know what we can do. Thank because you. Because we need to know. All right. Thank you well, for okay. having us. Thank you all so for grateful. tuning in. This is Pat McDonald, your host for Vote for Vermont.